I, uh, we were talking about the marathon. I was looking at the paper uh, yesterday. We were talking about the marathon, the trials, the Olympic trials for the marathon, and the, the record. All the records are held by Ethiopians. Um, that, that they just tend to be runners. Uh, they, they're small and they just really can run. But the record marathon times. Several people have posted marathon times that are with a pace of under five minute miles. 26 in a row miles in less than five minutes per mile. I couldn't run a five minute mile if you gave me all day uh, to do it. I couldn't run a five minute mile when I was 18 years old, much less. Right on. I mean, a five minute mile, you're running, that's a sprint to do a five minute mile. Your hair's blowing if you're doing a five minute mile. I find that unbelievable. <coughs> so we had, I was telling people earlier because of the marathon, we had four people at 8 o'clock service this morning. <laughs> two of whom were clergy. <laughs> one of whom was the husband of Glennis. There was one outsider who came for the 8 o'clock service. Glennis and uh, Paul and it stayed at the Magnolia last night. We do this every year at the, Mag at the marathon, just in case we were really to have some problems. We want to have somebody <laughs> here. And so he had said, we may need to rethink that. He said, if you look up, if you look at the hotel village on this, it, it cost us a couple of hundred dollars for one person at the eight o'clock service. <laughs> uh, so this is not our big Sunday. <laughs> I uh, don't remember where I read it, uh, I don't have an exact quote. I only remember the general idea. I am sure that Winston Churchill said it with much more <laughs> elegance than I will. Winston Churchill said everything with much more elegance than I do. But the story goes that as World War II was drawing to an end, the outcome certain even though there were still battles to be fought. Winston Churchill was standing on a hillside in England, near the channel, I believe, near the English Channel, with a group of people when a squadron of RAF airplanes flew overhead. British Air Force. There, he said, looking up, is the salvation of England and the demise of the British Empire. Had it not been for the airplane, England would have lost the war. The Battle of Britain was the, the battle for the airspace over the Channel and over England. A terrible long battle of attrition, but with Lynn Lysak, with American help, the British prevailed. Or he said something like that anyway. <coughs> Whatever his exact words were, or even if it really happened at all, it was a moment of prescience. Maybe Churchill just had a profound understanding of the change that was happening in the world. He was like that sometimes, but the world was about to shift in ways that would never return to like it was. As an island nation, England emerged as a world power in the middle of the 16th century with the uh, development of a powerful navy, with the defeat of the Spanish Armada by Sir Francis Drake for, um, for good Queen Elizabeth I in 1588 changed the world. It was one of those great turning points in history that we all learned about in our high school history classes. For the next 350 years or so, the British Navy dominated the world, establishing a, an empire that touched the farthest reaches of the world. Wherever there were goods to be sold, Wherever there was money to be made, there went the British Empire. 
the establishment of this country, our own history, really, was as a commercial venture rather than exploring new frontiers. Tinged, perhaps, with religious fanaticism, a touch of religious fanaticism, but the main engine of the colonization of the New World was economic, not political. As was said in the 19th and even into the 20th centuries, the sun never set on the British Empire. It was always daylight somewhere in the British Empire. And as Churchill understood, the airplane changed everything. Rules of engagement were all different. Battleships standing 15 miles off the coast were no longer the deterrent or the threat that they once were. Maybe England could have changed gears and become a world air power, but not really. Not really, not with all the investment in a world-class navy, not coming out of World War II. The Spanish Armada marked the beginning of the British Empire. World War II was its demise, marked the beginning of its end. And of course, it's not all that simple. It wasn't just the change in technology, as, in, as important as that technological change was, still is. But the world was changing in other ways as well. Imperialism <clears throat> fell out of favor. Imperialism became a bad word. And the whole concept of empires and empire building was giving way to the emergence of self-determination. It was happening all over the world. And the British monarchy was slowly giving way over a period of many years, more than a century. The British monarchy was giving way to democratic rule. And the monarchy was becoming more of a symbolic connection to history than an important part of governance. And partly also in World War II, the world saw in horror the danger of raw power, the raw power of empire in the hands of a Hitler. And the world changed in response. I used to think that Winston Churchill was the last Victorian. If you read biographies of Churchill, he was very Victorian, and I think he thought of himself as a, as a Victorian. He uh, once said that he had never in his life dressed himself. <laughs> he was always dressed by someone. He, uh, that's a hard picture to imagine, but they, uh, his, if you read, uh, what's his name? Um, the historian. I'll knock him up. William Manchester. If you read Manchester's biography of Churchill, he's, he paints his picture. He says that Churchill used to run around the house naked, uh, dealing with his servants until he got dressed. He, he took two baths a day, always baths. He never took showers. I try not to picture that, if you can imagine with Churchill. Uh, but then I, I saw Helen Mirren play uh, Elizabeth II, and I decided that she's really the last Victorian. <laughs> Elizabeth II is really a Victorian, I have to, I have to admit. But in any event, whoever the last Victorian was, the British Empire is no more. The British Empire is a thing of the past. Now the word Anglican means English. We can talk about Anglos. When we talk about Anglos, we're talking about English-speaking people. Um, the word means English, an Anglof Anglophile is a person who loves things that are British. The word means English. The Anglican Church is the Church of England. It is perhaps an accident of history, but not insignificant that the English Reformation, the emergence of the Church in England, happened roughly at the same time as did the Spanish Armada. The emergence of the Church of England 
happened about the same time, 30, 40 years earlier, but about the same time as the emergence of the British Empire. The British Empire and the Church of England emerge out of the same roots. They come from the same place. And the Church of England followed the spread of the British Empire wherever it went. Where the empire went, the church followed. <coughs> And in the beginning, it wasn't an indigenous church. It was not meant to be a church for the people of India. It was meant to be a church for the English people who ruled the people of India. It was a church of England all over the world. And the Anglican Communion today, the Anglican Communion is the collection of churches throughout the world that have an historical an ecclesiastical connection to the Church of England. The head of the Church of England, the ecclesiastical head of the Church of England, a distinction that will become important, but the ecclesiastical head of the Church of England is the Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, it is sometimes said that the Anglican Communion consists of those churches in the world, independent churches, that are in communion with the Archbishop of Canterbury. Some of these churches are quite large. The Anglican Church in Nigeria has about 17 or 18 million members. Some of the churches, like the Church of Wales, are quite small. Membership measured in the thousands. The American Episcopal Church has about 2 million or so members and is sort of in the middle. The Anglican Communion is a relatively new thing. It was actually created by an American bishop, uh, William White, one of the first three bishops in the Episcopal Church, the American Episcopal Church. He was the first and the fourth presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. William White was trying to find a way to hold together the Church of England with a new nation that had just fought a war of independence to separate itself, to get itself out from under the monarchy of England. And that was a big piece of work to do to hold this church together. And so he wrote of an informal confederation, a relationship of independence and interdependence, a relationship of fellowship, mutual support between two sovereign and autonomous churches, neither subject to the other but in relationship with each other. It is to be sure, even for William White, it was and still is nebulous without clear boundaries. What exactly it means to be in communion with the Archbishop of Canterbury is unclear. But it was not a time in the 18th century, it was not a time when there was a great deal of theological disagreement, and so it worked. And it served the church well enough. The Anglican Communion now consists of 38 different independent and autonomous churches. 38 independent autonomous bodies reflecting pretty much the spread of the British Empire. What holds that community together, that communion together, is mostly a historical connection with the British Empire. A kind of uniqueness of church that might be called Anglican. What holds it together, or has held it together, is a sense of goodwill for each other. 
In recent years, the Anglican Communion, what holds the glue that holds the Anglican Communion together, has been described in a wonderfully British way as the four instruments of unity. The English have such a wonderful way of casting words in ways that are very difficult to understand and so they can really be kind of mean whatever it is you want them to mean and that's really part of what it means to be Anglican. But the Anglican Communion now speaks of the four instruments of unity. These instruments, it is said, hold the Anglican Communion together. They are the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Lambeth Conference, the Anglican Consultative Council, and the Primates Meeting. The Archbishop of Canterbury is, of course, an ancient symbol of the Church of England. The office dates back to Augustine, back in the 6th, 7th century. The building of the cathedral in Canterbury. The building is, wow, what, 600? The building itself is 1,400 years old. I mean, it's a long time ago. The Archbishop of Canterbury has been the ecclesiastical head of the Church of England since the English Reformation. I mean, the Archbishop of Canterbury was, of course, before the English Reformation, was Roman Catholic, was appointed by the Pope. But since the English Reformation, the Archbishop of Canterbury has been the ecclesiastical head of the church, Thomas Cranmer being the first Archbishop of Canterbury to hold that office separately from the Pope. But it is important to remember that Henry VIII's argument was not theological but political. Henry insisted that the head of the church was not the Pope, but rather the King. The head of the church was not the Archbishop of Canterbury. The King appointed the Archbishop of Canterbury. The King, the monarch, was the head of the church. And Elizabeth I established that principle as law. And it is to this day the law of the land. The Archbishop of Canterbury is not elected by bishops or any other configuration of church membership. The Archbishop of Canterbury is appointed by the Queen through the office of the Prime Minister. Now, the Queen doesn't just go around and look at all the bishops and say, now, who do I want to have be the Archbishop of Canterbury? There are all sorts of ecclesiastical bodies that present, and this comes up in a today's world, it comes up in a much more orderly fashion, but it is still true that the Archbishop of Canterbury is appointed by the monarchy, that the Queen of England is the head of the church. That's the reason there's such a crisis about Philip becoming a king, by the way, uh, is that could a divorced person, divorced, remarried person, be the head of the church? Because that position is head of the church. Did I say something wrong? Charles. Charles. That's what I said, Charles. <laughs> uh, that's what I meant. Now, the Archbishop of Canterbury has no real authority outside the Church of England. He is the first among equals, but he is first only in respect of deference and respect. He does not dictate what the Anglican Church believes about anything. Many Archbishops of Canterbury have been theologians, as is the current Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams. He's written many books. He's a brilliant man, very difficult to read, uh, dense, dense writing. Uh, but he is a theologian, and many archbishops of Canterbury have been, many have, uh, have published, but their writings are a part of the ongoing theological discussion. They are not definitions of Anglicanism. They are not definitive. The archbishop of Canterbury cannot adjudicate conflicts or disagreements anywhere in the Anglican Communion outside of England. 
there is no constitution of the Anglican Communion, there are no canons, there are no regulations. It is a fellowship of autonomous churches held together by a common history and a common worship practice. There is also no copyright on the word Anglican. Any church can call itself Anglican in any way that it chooses. And there are a lot of them that do. Very confusing for the common person. In 1867, what is that, 150 years ago, the Archbishop of Canterbury, I can't remember what is, which one it was right now, but anyway, the Archbishop of Canterbury called for a conference of all the bishops in the world, all the Anglican bishops in the world, which, by the way, was about 150 bishops in 1867. And he called for this conference to meet in Lambeth for mutual support and conversation and to have some discussion about issues that were facing the church. Now the C, and that's S-E-E, -E, the C of Canterbury is, the C of the Archbishop of Canterbury is, of course, the cathedral, Canterbury Cathedral. That's where the Archbishop's chair is, where his seat is. The Archbishop does not speak ex cathedra like the Pope does, but if he did, he would speak from the chair in Canterbury. That's why it's called a cathedral, is because it houses, it is the location of the bishop's chair, the bishop's official seat. The cathedra is located in the cathedral. If he does, if the Archbishop of Canterbury does some formal act or proclamation, he would most likely do that from the cathedral in Canterbury. It is his cathedral. It is his altar. But he doesn't run the cathedral. There's a dean that runs the cathedral. There's a staff, canons, and lay people who do all of the business of the cathedral. They are responsible for its worship life and for its mission. The Archbishop of Canterbury does not live in Canterbury. <laughs> he lives in London. He lives in Lambeth. The Anglican Church Center is there. His offices are there. His staff is there. His residence is called the Lambeth Palace, which is also very English, uh, by the way. Interestingly, I've been to Canterbury twice. I've never been to Lambeth. And the, one of the times we were in London, we were right across the river from it. I just never bothered to go see it. It doesn't really have a lot of pizzazz. It's just a lot of offices. But anyway, the conference in 1867 was held at Lambeth, not Canterbury. And because of that, it became known as the Lambeth Conference. And since then, it has become a tradition to hold a Lambeth Conference every 10 years. Somehow, we got off a year because we're not doing it in the 67s or 77s, we're doing it in the 8s. So sometimes we must have missed and done 11 years once. But anyway, every 10 years there is a Lambeth Conference. It is the Archbishop of Canterbury's conference. There's nothing that requires it. There's nothing that makes it happen. There's no institutionalization that says we have to have a Lambeth Conference. The Archbishop of Canterbury hosts it. It is his conference. It is, he sets the processes, he sets the agenda, he establishes what's going to be talked about. It is his conference, and most importantly, he controls who gets invited. You have to be invited to go to the Lambeth Conference. You might say, and some people do, that what it means to be in communion with the Archbishop of Canterbury is to have a bishop who gets invited to Lambeth. Uh, this became a real issue with the election and consecration of Gene Robinson, a partnered, non now married, by the way, gay man as the Bishop of New Hampshire. He was the only bishop in the Anglican Communion. 
the only one who was not invited to the last Lambeth conference. And it caused, uh, in 2008, I guess, it caused quite a stir. It was a, a, a significant action. You could say that Jean Robinson was not in communion with the Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, I don't know how much about the first conference of Lambeth in 1867. The issues that prompted its calling were rather uh, remote from today's world. I'm not really of interest. It had something to do with some, something that the Privy Council in Canada was doing, and the Canadians were really upset and really alarmed, and so they asked the Archbishop of Canterbury to call a conference so that the bishops could all talk about the future of the Anglican Church. The idea had been actually suggested to the Archbishop ten years earlier by the Bishop of Virginia, who had written the Archbishop saying this would be a good idea to hold uh, whatever you call a conference that takes place once every ten years. It was not without controversy. The Archbishop of York, who is probably could be said to be the second most influential cleric in the Church of England, the Archbishop of York refused to attend because he thought the idea was terrible as he put it, to have clerics of churches that don't belong to our church there. Uh, so it was not sort of a universally accepted idea. The dean of Westminster Abbey refused to allow the closing service of the First Lambeth Conference to be held there because he didn't approve of this new radical idea. The fact that a conference was called is an indication that there was a perceived need to have some clarification. <coughs> there were issues that were stressing and straining the communion. So a conference was called. Now, the last conference in 2008 had about 800 bishops invited, 650 came, a large portion of African bishops boycotted the conference because they didn't like the Americans or the Canadians. We'll get to that. <laughs> the Lambeth Conference has no legislative function. It has no legislative authority. It can and does sometimes pass resolutions expressing the mind of the bishops gathered. But those resolutions are non-binding and they are rare. They just don't happen very much. It is meant to be a time of mutual fellowship and prayer and getting together. Sort of like in The Wizard of Oz. You remember the movie when the wizard is going to go back to Kansas with a, in a hot air balloon? He's saying goodbye to the people of Emerald City, and he says, I'm off into the stratosphere to hob hobnob and otherwise be with other wizards. Mm. And that's the purpose of the Lambeth Conference, to hobnob and otherwise be with other bishops. <laughs> the other two instruments of union are modern. They're modern developments. The Lambeth Conference in 1968 formed by resolution, formed something called the Anglican Consultative Council. I believe that the Anglican Consultative Council meets once every three years. I think that's right. And it has what's known as what's called the Joint Standing Committee, which is sort of like an executive committee of the Anglican Consultative Council. And it has a secretary, in that British kind of way, that means the person who's in charge of it. Um, uh, Kenneth Caron. Kenneth was here a couple of years ago. He's the General Secretary of the Anglican Consultative, the Joint Standing Committee of the Anglican Consultative Council. The unique thing about the council is that it consists of bishops, priests, and lay people from all each of the 38 member churches. They get together, I think, every three years and they talk about issues that are impacting the Anglican Communion. 1968 was just when liturgical renewal and the ordination of women was beginning to heat up. 
the Anglican Consultative Council was formed because of the stresses that were pushing on the Anglican Communion. In 1998, no, that's not right, uh, 1988 maybe, 1978, it was 10 years after the uh, ACC. Uh, 1978, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Daniel Coggan at the time, called for a meeting of the primates from each of the <coughs> churches, each of the bodies within the Anglican Communion. Now, primates does not mean monkeys. <laughs> Sometimes it can be confusing. But the same root, the word comes from the same word as primary. A primate is the person, the ecclesiastical head of a church is the primate. Uh, the nature of primates varies dramatically among the member churches of the Anglican Communion. The primate of our church, which has come to be called officially now the Episcopal Church, worldwide, if you were talking to the people in the Church of Scotland who were aware, if you just said the Episcopal Church, they would know you meant the church in the United States. But the primate of the Episcopal Church is the presiding bishop, a woman whose name is Catherine Jeffords Scorey. Not only a woman, but a woman with a hyphenated last name. I mean, you know, you're talking about modern. Anyway, <laughs> presiding bishop, the title comes from the fact that when all the bishops in our church get together in an official kind of way, the presiding bishop is the person who presides over the meeting. It is to say, presiding bishop is the president bishop. The presiding bishop is the president of the House of Bishops. All the bishops collectively in the Episcopal Church is referred to as the House of Bishops. Sometimes we use that rather uh, abstractly. We just talk about the House of Bishops right now. We would say the House of Bishops, so-and-so is in the House of Bishops. We're just talking about all the bishops, the collection of all bishops in the Episcopal Church. The House of Bishops meets annually in a formal, official capacity. They pass resolutions, they uh, put forward canonical changes to general convention, they do take all sorts of actions, and when they do so, the presiding bishop presides. The presiding bishop is elected by the bishops in the House of Bishops. The presiding bishop has some canonical authority in areas of discipline, especially areas of discipline within the house of bishops. If a, if, if a bishop is in violation of ordination vows, if the bishop is embezzling money from the diocese, or if the bishop has uh, run off and joined the Lutheran church, <laughs> the, uh, well, that's not true. Run off and uh, join the Missouri Senate Lutheran church, that would be true. Um, the presiding bishop has canonical authority uh, and can, has authority in that kind of sense. Mandatory retirement in the Episcopal Church is 72 years old. If a bishop reaches 72 and refuses to retire, the presiding bishop has the authority and the responsibility to declare the office vacant. It gets real technical. You can go to the end of the month in which your birthday occurs, and if you're a bishop, the presiding bishop can't declare the office vacant until you've been stayed there three months over. So you actually could remain bishop to 72 plus three months uh, extended on the month of your birthday. So the presiding bishop has some real authority, but the presiding bishop does not speak for the Episcopal Church. The only body that speaks for the church that has the authority to adopt policies for the church is general convention. It's the only body that can respond to those <coughs> kinds of issues. It meets once every three years. We are a very democratic church, which sometimes can be confusing and chaotic. 
the presiding bishop has no authority whatsoever in the Diocese of Texas apart from the Constitution and canons of the church adopted by general convention. Uh, if the presiding bishop came calling, we would certainly respond with deference and respect. But the presiding bishop would have no authority over the mission of this diocese or how we organize as long as we are in accordance with the constitution and canons of the church. In other Anglican churches, the primate has much clearer authority, a much more direct authority. The Archbishop of Nigeria, the primate of that church, has almost dictatorial authority. That difference has been a source of confusion, a source of anxiety between and misunderstanding within the Anglican Communion. When Barbara Harris was elected uh, suffragan bishop of Massachusetts, she was the first woman to be elected bishop in the Anglican Communion. And there were primates who didn't understand why the presiding bishop would allow it. It was the American church, from their view, because there are churches, most of the African churches do not recognize women's ordination. Many of the African churches don't. And as far as they were concerned, it was the American church acting unilaterally without paying much attention to the impact that this act would have on the rest of the communion. And they did not understand why the presiding bishop would allow it. I can't remember, but I think the presiding bishop at the time was Ed Browning, and he wouldn't have stopped it if he could have. But he could. He doesn't have that authority. There's not a thing in the world the presiding bishop could have done had he wanted to stop it. He doesn't have that authority. The archbishop of Nigeria does. He could just simply say, no, you can't do that. The fact that the Anglican Communion has four instruments of union that have been developed sequentially over a little more than a hundred years says something about the ambiguity of the Anglican Communion. If you think about it, these things didn't come about because we decided we were going to create an Anglican Communion and here's what we needed. They arose out of the confusion, <coughs> the stress, the strain that is endemic in that kind of relationship. It almost suggests, also suggests, that as we have moved into the 20th and 21st century, the stress on that unity has increased. It's increased exponentially at an increasing rate. The Archbishop of Canterbury, the Lambeth Conference, the Anglican Consultative Council, I think it is particularly significant that at least two, that the last two of those instruments were created ten years apart. The Anglican Consultative Council didn't get the job done. So we decided to form a primates meeting. The instruments of unity may be preserving a unity that is an illusion more than it is anything else. That stress came to a focal point with the election and consecration of Gene Robinson as Bishop of New Hampshire. Primates of some churches, mainly the churches in Africa, not all of them, but most of them, where the Anglican church is growing at a rapid rate. It is the fastest growing church in the world, or has been, those churches declared themselves out of communion with the Episcopal Church in America and the Church of Canada. The Church of Nigeria, the Church of Uganda have been particularly vocal, but they are not alone. That group of Anglican churches tends to be called the Global South. I'm not sure what that means. It's jargon, but you will hear people talk about, well, the Global South is going to do so and so. I don't know why. Uh, Australia wouldn't be a part of the Global South, but it's not. Um, the Archbishop of Canterbury formed a committee to consider the action of the Episcopal Church in that consecration and what the implications of it were for the Anglican Communion. 
That's what you do, always, is you form a committee. <laughs> <laughs> that committee, you know this, that committee met in Windsor, and the report that it issued is generally referred to as the Windsor Report. The Windsor Report called for three things. It called for a lot of things, but it called for three things that were really important. One was it called for a moratorium on the election of openly non-celibate gay people as bishops. It called for also in the same statement, it called for a moratorium on the blessing of same-sex unions. Secondly, it called for discontinuing crossing juris lines of jurisdiction by bishops from one member of the Anglican Communion with others, so that the Bishop of Uganda could not have Episcopal churches in the United States. And it called for the consideration of a document that would be definitive of the Anglican Communion and would be called the Anglican Covenant. The Windsor Report has been observed in the breach by all parties. Uh, actually, General Convention did go one General Convention uh, deferring the election. Uh, it, it called for a moratorium of all elections of bishops. And we went for a year without electing any bishops and then exercised some restraint uh, one year. And then the next year, we elected several gay bishops. And we have dioceses in the Episcopal Church that are not only blessing same-sex unions, we have dioceses that are doing marriages in states where marriage is legal. And we have the Church of Uganda and the Church of Nigeria, and we have uh, all sorts of, uh, of, of those things are still there. The Anglican Covenant has been six or seven years in the forming. It is, consists of four parts. It's about 100 pages long, 75, 80 pages long. It is a statement of what we believe, and I actually like what it has to say about mission. I think it's well said. And, but it's mostly mom and apple pie. We believe God is good. Um, we believe that you know Jesus you know, is extra good. Um, we you know we believe all of this is sort of basic fundamental Christian faith. And the fourth section is a section of consequences of what happens to a member church uh, that doesn't that operates outside the instruments of unity, that goes off unilaterally and does things that it's asked not to do. That section is convoluted, it is complex, I doubt that it would ever be able to be put into use. Uh, it, would really, it would really just be a nightmare to try to do something with it. In the process now, we are now in the process where the several churches in the Anglican Communion are considering the Anglican Covenant. It's been reviewed and revised and commented on um, by all the churches. And some churches have already rejected it. I heard yesterday that the Church of Scotland had said no. There's some other churches that have already said no. The Global South, to use the jargon, has signaled that it is not interested anymore, that it's not going to sign on to it. Uh, they issued a statement oh, a couple of years ago that the Anglican Communion was not a road worth pursuing, that it was fatally flawed. And so the Global South, which was really the motivation for creating the covenant to start with, has signaled that they are not <coughs> going to participate. And I don't believe it stands a chance in hell of passing General Convention this summer. I've been to General Convention and I do not see the Anglican Covenant passing. Our bishop has been supporter of it. Uh, he, uh, there's stuff the diocese has put out uh, supporting the Anglican Communion. I really am not. Uh, I am not a delegate, a deputy to General Convention this summer. If I were, I would not vote for it. I don't believe it will work. And if it did work, I believe it would only work by creating something other than what we are. I think we would have to give up being Anglican in order to preserve the Anglican community. And I don't think that's a price worth paying. I don't believe I have been out 
jury has been out on this for a bit. I do not believe that the Anglican Communion is going to survive as we know it. And I believe we are coming to the end. I believe within the next five years, the Anglican Communion will come apart. I, uh, I'm sad about that. I regret it. I like being able to say that I'm part of a, of a worldwide church that has 60 million members or 80 million members, depending on who's counting. Of course, 32 million of those are English, the English, and um, maybe less than a tenth of a percent of them actually go to church, but they're still members of the <laughs> Anglican Church. Um, I, I, I like having that relationship, but I don't believe that the right path is to choose unity at any cost. Uh, John Hines used to say, unity for what? Unity for what purpose? Unity is not an end in itself. <laughs> unity is only valuable if we are in unity for mission, if we are in unity in pursuit of justice. If, full, if the price for preserving the unity of the Anglican Communion is to delay the full inclusion of gay and lesbian people until the entire world says they're ready to move forward, the price is too high. I'm not willing to do that. And the truth is, what I've been trying to say today is that I believe that the Anglican Communion began an inexorable movement toward its end when Winston Churchill stood on that hillside in England. I believe that we are the last vestige of the British Empire and the British Empire <laughs> is no more that the church trails society by 50 years is not unusual. That the church takes the church 50 years to reflect what's already happened in the world is not unusual. In fact, that's moving pretty fast for the church. I do believe that something will emerge, something new and different will emerge. It may be nothing more than having a historical affiliation, a historical connection that we come from the same roots, but it may be more than that. And so I wanted to talk about where we are with that as a way of laying the groundwork for what does it mean to be Anglican? What, what can we say as the Episcopal Church? You know, it doesn't mean to be a part of the Church of England anymore. We may have to come up with a new name because we, we call ourselves Anglican and then we say, well, we're not a part of the Church of England. Um, we are historically. So, that's your history lesson for today. Oh, wow. <laughs>